Good afternoon. This is my second attempt at a video. Apparently the first one I didn't turn on the microphone, so whoops. Sorry about that. I'm just going to real quick go through reconstruction and the things that you should know for the test that's coming up. So let me get started on this real quick. Make it short and sweet. First of all, I showed you this already in class, but just in case you don't remember it, here it is again. There were two competing plans for reconstruction. Uh, before the war ended. One was called the Lincoln 10% Plan, formerly the Proclamation of Amnesty and Reconstruction. The other is the Wade Davis Bill that was going through Congress. Uh, with Lincoln's 10% Plan, it was called that because he basically wanted, wanted to find 10% of the people who voted in 1860 to pledge allegiance to the United States. Uh, ultimately, that would have been pretty easy to do because those that wanted to succeed were in the minority in almost every state. For Congress, it was not strict enough. So instead of 10%, Congress wanted 50% of people to swear an oath to the United States. And Congress wanted what was known as the ironclad oath, which said that you never once supported the Confederacy. Lincoln was not a fan of the Wade Davis bill. Lincoln thought 50% and the ironclad oath was too much. Congress thought Lincoln was too easy and that 10% wasn't punishment enough. So what happens is Lincoln's 10% plan never passes through Congress and the Wade Davis bill is vetoed by the president. So when the war ends, there are zero plans on what to do. The United States government also has to figure out emancipation. Uh, the war, contrary to popular belief, did not become about ending slavery until 1863. So in 1863, with the Emancipation Proclamation, that's when the war changes from being just preserving the, the Union to ending slavery. So when slavery becomes the main focus of the war, they really have to figure out what are we going to do, who's going to help. Uh, is the Army going to help? Is the Treasury Department going to help? Or is it going to be private groups? And it comes down really to three different groups. The Army can only assist for a short amount of time. Basically, here's a blanket, here's a tent, here's a meal. Uh, wait here until something else happens. Uh, after that, you have the U.S. Treasury agents. Uh, they've got money. Uh, they're handing out money, and they basically want to... Um, they want to get these workers back to work as quickly as possible for, um, for money purposes, really. And then you have private businessmen who are just going to try and um, make as much money as they can from the land and put the former slaves to work. Uh, but what it all comes down to, whether it's the army, the treasury agents, or even private businessmen, is money and labor. Now, when the former slaves get their freedom, there are a couple of steps they kind of have to go through. First of all, uh, in many cases, they have to find their family members simply because, uh, you know, families were broken up constantly. Uh, so they have to figure out where their family's gone. Then they have to figure out, well, where are we going to live or not live? Things like that. Um, and then many times they have to get help. The group of people or the, the government entity that helps them was called the Freedmen's Bureau. Now the Freedmen's Bureau is technically called the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, but more often than not it's just known as the Freedmen's Bureau. And the Freedmen's Bureau is going to give food to former slaves, it's going to provide the former slaves with clothing, uh, legal assistance, and medical help as well. Now, what were the conditions of these former slaves? Well, very often it was the same as what they were doing when they were slaves. Um, the biggest difference is now instead of working for a master and not getting paid, they're getting paid small amounts of money. But really nothing else changes. If a slave was a field worker, when they're free, they're probably going to be a field worker. If a slave was a house servant, then they're probably going to be a house servant after the war, too. Um, the biggest difference, once again, they're now having to pay for their own food, their own clothing, and their own medical care. 
Another surprising thing is that labor is forced after the war. Basically, it becomes illegal to be unemployed. And you get this idea called the Black Codes. Uh, these were laws put in place to restrict the movement and the ability of these former slaves. Now, just one real important note, these Black Codes are not the same as Jim Crow that you may have heard of. Jim Crow is going to be something that starts really in the 1880s, 1890s, and these Black Codes are immediately after the Civil War, 1860s. Now, what were the Black Codes? The most important one, the biggest one, it became illegal to be unemployed. If you were found to be unemployed, it led to a fine. If you couldn't pay your fine, you went to jail. And then somebody, usually a former slave owner, would get you out of jail, and then you would have to work off uh, the amount that you owe that person. Also, some black codes were limited where you could live, where you could move, where you could go, whether you could rent land, buy land. It even became illegal to assemble in any number. So conditions for former slaves, not really that much different. The president after Lincoln is assassinated is Andrew Johnson, and he's kind of an interesting case. Uh, first thing is Andrew Johnson was a Democrat where Lincoln was a Republican. Uh, Lincoln chose a Democrat for his vice president the second time because he wanted to show that he was willing to work with everybody and thought this would bring the country together. Uh, Andrew Johnson, on the other hand, when the war was over, he said the, the South was doing well. Um, you know, slavery's over. Let's just let things go. So when Congress tries to pass the Freedmen's Bureau Act and the Civil Rights Act of 1866, Andrew Johnson says, no, we don't need that, and vetoes it. And then Congress invents some fake laws, or I should say they pass some unconstitutional laws, limiting what Johnson could do. Johnson knew the laws were illegal, and he said, nope, I'm not going to listen to these. And Andrew Johnson gets impeached for ignoring what Congress said. Ultimately, Johnson does stay president by one vote, but he's pretty much done with any power. The radical Republicans of 1866 are going to take over and pretty much steer everything that happens for Reconstruction from then on. Uh, radical Reconstruction, it really starts with the Reconstruction Act of 1867. Um, to make it really simple to understand, all of the state governments that were formed in the South are dismantled, and the military is going to patrol the South for about the next three to four years. Uh, there's martial law, state constitutions have to be rewritten, and African Americans must be allowed to vote before a Southern state is allowed back into the Union. The Radical Reconstructionists also refinanced the Freedmen's Bureau, gave them more money so that they could continue their work. And for a brief amount of time, Republicans dominated state governments in the South, primarily because so many white voters could not vote. Now, once we get to 1873, Democrats take back over in the South, and Democrats maintain control of the South until the early 2000s, late 1990s. Not everybody likes Reconstruction. I'm sure you could imagine um, that it was a real change in the way Southern life was happening. Uh, there were political attacks against Reconstructionists, political attacks against Democrats. There were violent attacks, uh, primarily by the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK. Uh, the KKK was begun by a guy named Nathan Bedford Forrest in Pulaski, Tennessee. Uh, it was originally a social club, and then it turns violent. Now, the, who did the KKK hate? Well, it was pretty equal opportunity. They disliked black voters. They disliked white Republicans. They disliked uh, union leaders. They disliked Freedmen's Bureau. All of those groups, equal opportunity hatred, equal opportunity violence. Now, Congress is eventually going to respond to the KKK with the Enforcement Act and the KKK Act. It officially made the Klan illegal, it outlawed Klan violence, and it allowed the federal government to arrest Klan members. Now, there are three Reconstruction Era amendments that you need to know. There's the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment. 
Thirteenth Amendment, December 6th, 1865, that officially ends slavery. The Fourteenth Amendment, July 9th, 1868, that made former slaves citizens, and that's what undid the Dred Scott case. And then the Fifteenth Amendment, February 26th, 1869, that gave all males the right to vote, whether they were um, former slave, black, white, green, yellow, whatever it might be. Now notice the 15th Amendment, it looks good on paper. Everybody who is male gets the right to vote, but it does not stop voting based on um, poll taxes, literacy taxes, anything like that. So even though the 15th Amendment is supposed to give everybody the right to vote, it really doesn't because Southern governments are going to find ways around the 15th Amendment, at least temporarily. All right, I know that was quick. That should give you everything you need to know for the, the final exam. Make sure you're studying for that final exam, and we will see you on Thursday. Have a good week. Bye-bye.